I'm here to talk about duty. I'm here to talk about conscience. I'm here to talk about character. I'm here to talk about the courage to be. A long time ago, I was a 17-year-old with a college acceptance letter in my hand, and I signed an eight-year contract of service. The recruiter was waiting outside of my high school history class. The Army Reserves is perfect for you, he said. It's good money, and it'll make a woman out of you. Now, people have this perfect idealized vision of courage that they carry around, and often that person's wearing a uniform. And that can be true, but sometimes it's not for the reasons that you think. I was, um, I was a kid from very early on who believed in duty and service. I was student body president of my high school. I organized food drives. I, I started the first black student union at a mostly white high school. I, yeah. <laughs> I used my, my hands, my time, my focus. I believed, as I learned in Sunday Sermon, that I was an instrument. But for the moment, my bus pulled up alongside of some uniform buildings in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, for boot camp. And a red-faced drill sergeant ordered us off the bus and in line, and his hostile assessment of each one of us. The moment I buttoned up my green battle dress fatigues and laced up my combat boots and pulled my cap over tied back hair low across my eyes, the moment he pulled a young woman out of line to show us how to stand at attention, body just so, arms just so, eyes forward and unfixed, they told us to yell only in response to a direct question. Drill sergeant, yes, that, that reverse order of words confusing me in this new normal. And the thing I heard again and again and again, you are not paid to have an opinion. You are paid to follow orders. And so I did. I qualified on the rifle range with my M16, shooting at human-shaped targets. I, I shot my M60 machine gun. I practiced with my hand grenade and my bayonet, and all summer in boot camp, I practiced shooting and stabbing. But I also practiced not reacting um, to what I was practicing for. I had never, up until that point in my life, been around so many women. There were 300 women in my company, some twice my age, from places in the history book, of Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia. And after a very intense day, we'd go back to the barracks and we'd stretch out on our wool drab blankets or dangle off our bunks, our dog tags jangling. A new friend would grease my scalp, abraid my hair. And after lights out, we'd whisper to each other why we were here and what we'd hoped for um, when we were through. You know, boot camp was a long time ago, but I still remember the ways that I was remade. That summer, early on, a drill sergeant I wasn't familiar with plucked me out of an early morning uh, formation and took me to another part of the base to use as a threat to his own unit of female soldiers. I saw myself through their eyes as I was debased by order down and push a position, then up, then down, then up, then down again. He told me I looked like a gang member. Then later that summer, a drill sergeant ordered me into her office looking for evidence against a soldier that they suspected was gay. Then later, um, as I was going to the commissary to buy maxi pads, I was accused by another drill sergeant of fraternizing with the male soldiers that lined the aisles. I'll rip your head off and shit in your neck, he threatened. And then, a few weeks later, 
the same drill sergeant came up to me on graduation day. He looked me up and down in my dress greens and my boxy black shoes and tie, my medals and my newly earned accelerated promotion. You look good, girl, he said. Meet me later. I was a combat medic. I trained in Fort Sam Houston in Texas. A combat medic's job is to return the fighting force to the field as soon as possible. I was taught a concept called triage. In the military, triage meant to prioritize care for those least injured. When I was assigned a duty station, it was a veterans hospital near the university that I attended. There, there were, the, the hospital was full of men some decades from their original war wounds. Some that had come in with these terrible uh, uh, bed sores because they didn't have adequate care at home. Others had scabies from a difficult life of being homeless on the streets. I couldn't wear my battle dress fatigues um, in the, on the hospital floor with the risk of re-traumatizing and triggering those that had already suffered trauma or moral injury. It wasn't that I experienced this and didn't feel anything. I felt a dull ache. My heart began to hurt, and over time, that ache became more prominent. I could not quite ignore it all. But I also could not say what I was seeing and what I was feeling. Instead, I followed orders. You, you see, um, if I'm going to be honest, I was afraid. Because all the things that I saw in all my training and early life crystallized the dawning realization in me that service meant silence. It meant silencing myself. It meant turning my eyes away, to resisting that notion, to raise my head up against undulating waves and, and search for shore, to swim in, in fast, hard strokes toward home, that home in my heart. And so, for me, the silence became the thing that I knew uh, shackled me you know, the root of the word courage is core, it means heart. And it took several more years and a war in the Persian Gulf for me to find the courage to apply for and earn a discharge, an honorable discharge as a conscientious objector uh, in the military. It's one of the hardest discharges. I'm probably one of the only people you'll ever meet with this legal designation of a soldier who's recognized to be against war. And it's a hard road because I not only wanted to do that, I needed to speak the truth that had been hidden in my heart for so long. In order to earn a discharge as a conscientious objector, as a member of the military, I met with a chaplain, psychiatrist, investigating officers in a hearing, and then my case took three years to go up the chain of command, during which I continued to wear the uniform and fulfill my duties at my unit. Most people would have given up, but for me, it was important that I continue to take a strong stand and to tell people what I had learned, even as my voice shakes, even as I felt afraid. Um, I recognized there was a duty to myself that was bigger than the duty that I understood uh, before, a duty to my heart. I listened to my conscience, and I acted on it. Years later, I ran into a friend who was a friend from uh, military training, and she and I had lost touch when she moved back to the Midwest uh, to her duty station. And when we reconnected, I told her my whole journey. I was like, you know, I, I had this, this conflict in my heart, and here's what I did, and the whole story. And then I said, well, what, what have your last years been like? 
And she said, well, I, I felt that same conflict, but I borrowed a pregnant friend's pee to get out of the duty. And so what I learned is kind of similar to what Robert Kennedy said, which is that moral courage is rarer than bravery on the battlefield. And to be honest, life is about choices all of our lives. You can either accept the world that you came into or create a world of your making. You can accept the fate that's handed to you or create a fate of your making. And so even though we are given certain choices, we make certain choices, we have the ability, especially in times of crisis, to reach in to the very human capacity that we all have to listen and act on our conscience. And we are in a time of crisis. Think of the rising the, uh, nationalism. Think of the climate, global climate crisis, attacks on immigrants, the fact that we're not unified. Humanity is not unified. But it especially is now in a time of crisis where the conscience becomes most important for us to attune to and listen to. Now, my experience going from combat medic to conscientious objector um, it gave me great personal freedom, but it also did a couple of other things. It helped me to recognize the people around who are standing up in courage and saying, I cannot in good conscience do this or say this or cooperate in this way. And it also gives me the ability to encourage people to stand up and be courageous in their own lives, even if they feel uh, scared or lonely or embattled. The history of change in this world is, is crafted by the people with the courage to refuse to accept the way things are, to interrupt their training or the stories that we've been told for a long time and to open up their hearts in order to imagine a new way of being and a new world. We're also told that courage is the stuff of exceptional people. It's not true. We all have the capacity to have a warrior's heart in the way that it makes sense to ourselves. Now, the story of me coming into conscience is mine, but it's, it's not mine. It's ours. We should not live in a country or a world where living by your conscience is considered a dangerous act. Conscience, actually, is the bulwark against authoritarianism, against fascism, against a system that tells us, you have no right to think, you cannot have an opinion, you must accept the way things are. And actually, living by your principles, living by what you know is right and wrong, and living out loud that way is the sign of a healthy democracy. It's the, it's the it's an indication of strong moral character, and it's a measure of personal and collective freedom. I often think of my hero, Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman, um, in the face of almost insurmountable odds and the horrors of the system of slavery, not only freed herself, but she answered the call to conscience and went back again and again at great personal risk to save hundreds of people, to literally transform people from slave to free, not because it was easy, not because the law said it was okay, not because somebody uh, gave her permission, but because she acted in accordance to her con uh, conscience and showed incredible courage that continues to inspire people to this day. Our conscience may start deep inside of a dark recess in our heart. The voice may be, over time, hard to hear. But, the con but our conscience is most powerful when lived out loud and when, sh when shared, when the truth that we know is brought to light, is spoken out loud, that we have the courage to do that. We have the courage to be. 
And that's the definition of freedom. Thank you.